thank you for coming. Um, so I've already explained what I'm doing now <laughs> at the, my company. I'm documentation owner, uh, which means that I have to write documentation, but also uh, sort of like make the decisions on the design, like the way uh, docu I want documentation to be delivered to the user. Um, who are the people who should be doing that part of the work, that part of the work, that part of the work, how everything comes together. So it's kind of like a whole process. So as I was explaining at the beginning, when I uh, did the, pre the, the title of the presentation, I named it like how to write inclusive uh, tech documentation. But in the end, I'm going to touch upon uh, several subjects. So starting with uh, defining like what is inclusive documentation, and then why it, I think it should be that way. Um, a few best practices. Uh, I didn't know how to call them because really it's not anything standard. Uh, it's some, some practices that I try to implement myself because I think they're good. Um, and the reason I actually wanted to do this presentation and present this to you is because I cannot find like anything on inclusivity in technical writing at the moment. Like whenever I go to a conference or I try to get uh, educated on the subject, there's very little uh, like about this. And I'm always disappointed about the talks that I, that I see that have the word diversity or inclusion in the title because it's never what I'm looking for. <laughs> so in the end, I've decided to browse across like all, you know, like areas of, uh, basically doing good documentation in the software, the, the open source software industry we're in, and to pick and choose like what I think is uh, relevant to do uh, like a documentation that's inclusive of all users. And then, yeah, like uh, we can have a QA and a or a debate because maybe, maybe you don't agree with some of the things that I offer or I don't know, like you have a different understanding of inclusive documentation or whatever. I know these topics are always a little like, I don't know, um, sensitive. <laughs> People have different perceptions of what inclusivity means. And this is why, like, so the first thing I wanted to do is to give, so uh, like the official definition of inclusivity from the dictionary. So it's the quality of trying to include many types of people and treat them all fairly and equally. That's all it is. So many types of people, it's not really <laughs> defined here. Um, this is problematic. And then there's treat them all fairly and equally, uh, which is also like people have a tendency to, but I treat all people fairly and equally. Like, what do you mean? Or blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, like not all people have the, this understanding of what's fair or even the visibility of uh, the different types of people or, yeah, that kind of thing. So. From this uh, definition, I crafted my own <laughs> uh, for inclusive documentation. In my opinion, inclusive documentation is a documentation that takes into account all of its users, regardless of gender, culture, abilities, etc. Because I'm not sure if, for example, sexuality like comes into comes into play when it comes to a documentation. For me, it's more like gender, like will have an impact on that. Um, but yeah, this is debatable. But for now, I'm like, I just focused on that. Um, so what, so basically a lot of people also, I've, asked, I've heard this question also like of why, but why do we need to, include everyone it's it's impossible you know like to include everyone and all the sensitivities of each group of users into one place how do you do this and, and why do we do, do we want to do that in the first place uh you know it's effort and blah 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 so for me the answer is like really simple it's because you're writing for your user so it doesn't really matter what you think it matters what your user thinks you know, like basically, <laughs> uh, even if you don't agree that, oh, but I don't know, I don't want to use uh, gender neutral language. It sounds weird, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yes, 
but again, the user like will have the final word on that. So yeah, that's basically your job to make your user feel at ease and included when they read your documentation. And to me, that's the only reason you should be writing inclusive, like the main reason really, you should be writing like inclusive documentation. Yeah, so I hope this is clear. <laughs> Not the user, the user. Uh, so about the best practices. So the first step, I think for me, uh, would be to educate yourself. There are several ways you can do this. Uh, there's a lot of trainings out there, you know, like even in companies about like uh, biases, like unconscious biases, uh, like how to, I don't know, include this or this target group or yeah. Like there are a lot of trainings, but for me, like I never found what I, what I was looking for in these trainings. Like for example, um, actually I was talking about that with uh, Anka uh, at lunch. So I took a few classes with the, with the TECOM. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this organization, TECOM. It's the, like the German organization for technical writers basically. And they provide like a lot of uh, a lot of classes and things like that uh, for to train people in technical writing, people who don't necessarily have the background in technical writing or and they have all these classes. And I took a few with them, and the few classes that I had on the target user on how to define like how to reach your target user were really just sounded really weird to me um, because. In all the exercises that I was uh, asked to do, I was basically asked to draw conclusions on just very general data about the user. Like for example, so I, I had this uh, discussion with a, with a teacher once because, so we had this use case. Okay, so your user, like the main target group, uh, they're gonna work in the, like uh, outdoor works, you know, because it was, I think we were supposed to do a manual for um, some tool, like some, I'm not sure, drill or whatever. So your target user is gonna have, hey, <laughs> is gonna work outdoors. They probably come from immigration, probably they're Polish. Uh, and that means because of that, that means that probably they don't speak German very well, or um, they, I don't know, they don't have like a high level of education. Yeah, right? <laughs> so when I was hearing this, first of all, it was kind of like hurting my own sensitivity because I'm also an immigrant <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm not a native German speaker, yet I was there learning about technical writing in a German class. And I was, I was super offended, but I was trying not to show it because I don't know, they, they, I was the only one like offended in the, in the class. And I was like, but, but why does that, I mean, like, so what am I, what am I supposed to, like, which conclusions am I supposed to draw from this data? And they were like, well, you know, so if they don't have a high level of education and they're non-native speakers, you might want to use like super simplified English because they probably don't like to read or they probably, you know, like, um, I don't, they won't understand German and blah, blah, blah. And to me, that didn't make any sense. <laughs> because I was like, but these people are working in the field. So they probably know better the terminology, the German terminology for that than me at this point. Um, and also, it's not because, I mean, no one likes to read the manual. I, I don't, I don't know anyone who likes to read the manual, to be honest. Like, no, no, that's not true. I met two people who like to, <laughs> to read manuals. I can count them on my fingers because like they like to understand how a product works before buying it. But this, it's really a minority. I mean, by experience, like no one likes to read manuals. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're educated or not educated. Um, so this was the kind of knowledge that I was provided with, uh, from the beginning and, Searching myself, I was like, I cannot find like anything about uh, user behavior, user pattern, like uh, how they interpret things, like what kind of, I mean, sure, yeah, we have to use simplified English. We have to, you know, make things as clear as possible, as concise as possible. But what do I do if I want to 
they get into my user's mindset. And basically, for me, I think the best uh, thing that I ever did was to exchange with the people in my life. So what I mean by that is, there's another way to call this, it's called practice empathy. Um, I don't know if you've heard about that practice, because <laughs> uh, it's, it's an official like term, like empathy, practice empathy. So I mean that it's only by exchanging with the people you care about that you're going to understand where they come from. So I don't know, for example, in your family or your friends or who, like your colleagues or whoever, like in your like social circles, there's maybe a black person, there's maybe an LGBT person, um, there's maybe, I don't know, like people who represent like some minority, I say minority because for me it's like, I mean, people, these people are all over the place. So I don't, I'm not sure why we call them min like women minorities or again, <laughs> you know, like it's half of the population, but considered like minorities. So, you know, like just maybe like ask them questions, um, like just try to understand, like, so, you know, can you, can you tell me, I don't know about your experience about, I don't know, like, what does it mean to you that uh, this thing happened or what does it mean to you to, to be, so for example, I'm, I'm queer. So like, I really appreciate actually when people are trying to understand where I'm coming from and they, and they just ask me the questions like, so what does it mean to you when, I don't know, like, why is it so important for you that I, um, that I refer to you as a queer person and not like a straight person or whatever. And then, you know, you can engage in a non-aggressive way and just kind of get to understand, you know, like what's, going on in people's mind. And then when you understand this, I think you understand why, like it really guides your process uh, in writing a documentation. But this only happens, I think, if you exchange with the people you care about. Because you don't want to hurt, you know, like the people you care about. You want them to feel included, I think. I don't know, maybe you don't like people. Uh, <laughs> like, like maybe there are some people in your social circles you don't like and you don't, you don't want them to feel good. I don't know. But like, I feel like if you care about that person, you wouldn't, you would want them to feel good and to feel included in your, you know, like in whatever you're writing for them. So for me, like that's really the best thing I did like ever, like to educate myself is just by asking questions and just, yeah, talking with people. If you don't like talking with people, though, I have another piece of advice is paying attention to the news. Yes, because <laughs> like, a lot is happening. So for minorities, again, in terms of, I don't know, passing laws or whatever, like doing uh, like, I don't know, for example, Germany recently voted like, I think a year or two ago, like the marriage for all. So same-sex couples and heterosexual couples. So it's always interesting to kind of follow, um, to read about it and to read what were, so what were the, who were the opponents? Who were the people who were for it? Like how things happen? Like it kind of explain like the whole process and why this law is important and why it got passed. So it, yeah, it's a like, news of reflection of so what's happening in society. So I think it, it, helps a lot, like to get a lot of information about different, different people. Like this, for me, this is really the, the two main things. Like you can do all of the trainings that you want about unconscious bias or things like that. But if you don't relate to anything, I think it will not print in your, print in your head. Um, so anyways, so that's, that would be the first step I would, I would take. Um, then, so I want to talk a little bit about language, uh, but first I'm going to plug my laptop because I unplugged it. <laughs> so, yes, use language as a tool. So I thought, so langu language is where I started my career. I used to be a translator, um, so I translated from English and German into French. And I moved from being a translator to being a linguist and training, uh, like basically doing quality controls over language corpora that was fed into machine translation engines uh, for eBay. 
And then after that, I reoriented myself into technical writing. I'm not going to explain like why, how. I just like doing a lot of things. Um, but language has always been very important to me. And I think I finally understood like why. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Because uh, you can do many things with language. So I have, yeah. So in this part, I'm just sharing like some references. Um, I'm not going to show you like all of them. I'll send the PowerPoint anyway so that you guys can just uh, click and see where it goes. Um, but basically, you have to understand that language shapes the way we think. And this has been proven. Uh, the research is quite recent, actually. Like, it's from 2017. And yeah, like the last, uh, the last research on that. So for a long time, we thought, we were asking the question, like, so does, is it the way we think that influences the language, or is it the language that influences the way we think. And actually, it's the, it's the language. Like really, so this cognitive scientist, Lera Boroditsky, uh, she explains in a TED talk that's uh, in link here, that basically you do, not, you do not express yourself like the same way if you're born with this language or this language. So she takes the example of, I don't know, Americans who are used to give directions, you know, using, north or south, like, for example, if you would ask someone, like, where is uh, the street, da, 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 oh, you have to go, like, 200 meters north, and then, like, 300 meters east, and, yeah, to us Europeans, like, I mean, to me, at least, like, that means nothing, I don't know where is the north, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know anything, like, I would need more of a, a left and right sort of indication, and that's because, like, we don't use because it's in our culture, and we don't have these references in our language that we think that way. Uh, and this is the language that does that. So knowing this, there's a lot of things you can already, you know, like knowing your target, your target user, you can implement, you know, like you understand that they don't think the same way as you. So you will, you know, like use other ways to express, you know, like the, the, the instructions. Um, but apart from that, it's also a very interesting like uh, TED talk, and I would really advise you to watch it. It's just 13 minutes, and she explains it like very well how it works. Um, yes. Uh, then, yes, the word you choose matters. So there are other studies, so also quite recent, that show, for example, that the use of gender neutral pronouns and of, uh, of inclusive writing in general, so first of all, reduce biases like against minorities. And second of all, they also boost positive feelings in these minorities. These minorities do feel included. So knowing this is also very powerful, you know, because like we had no proof so far, you know, like that this is doing like anything. And this was always the debate, like, but should, why should I write like a gender inclusive uh, documentation? So first of all, I said, you're writing for your user, not for yourself. Second of all, it does, you know, have an effect. So I've linked actually like two articles that talk about it. One is from Wired and one is from The Guardian. And they talk about the same study that was done in Sweden where, uh, so um, gender neutral pronoun was actually officially added to the Swedish language in 2015. Like, hen, I think. Don't ask me the other two ones, like, I don't remember. <laughs> but basically what they did is that they, so after they introduced that, uh, they did this study where they gathered like a sample of people, they split them into three groups, and then they asked uh, the three groups to, yes, this is what I wanted to show as well, like, they showed them a picture, which was this one. Oh, didn't know how to insert that in the PowerPoint. This copyright and stuff. So they showed them this picture, the three groups. And each of the group was tasked with uh, explaining what's happening in the picture. And one group had to use only like the male pronoun. One group had to use the gender neutral one. And one group had to use like the feminine pronoun. After telling the, so after they made them do the, this task, 
then they made, they made them do another test. They asked them to fill a story that was pre-written uh, about like a person, but we didn't know their gender, uh, running for office. And they managed to show that basically the people who, had, who were tasked with describing everything, you know, like um, with the gender neutral pronoun, basically had less biases. Like they would not assume that the person running for office was automatically a man, like compared to the, the other two groups. So yeah, like this was, this is one of the, the latest study on that. And then they also, I think they, they gave them a question, a questionnaire to them and yeah, about how they feel about, I don't know, like other minorities and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, like it, they correlated like the two of them. Anyways, uh, it works, <laughs> at least for the Swedish language. So it's interesting to know that. And uh, if you were ever hesitating, you know, um, to use gender neutral language, you can feel okay about it. Because <laughs> there's a study that proves that it does have an impact. And so the, I've put the link to the two articles for you to read afterwards. Like I put the two articles because they approach the subject from different angles. So I thought it was good to have different perspectives on it. Um, and yeah, I personally, like this is the only thing I, <laughs> I implement like every day in my documentation is using, using basically like inclusive language in all of my documentation. So I use, I write in English. So this is much easier because I can just use it there. I don't, I don't have a solution for the people <laughs> who write in German or in French, or this is a lot more complicated because you would have to add like a lot more text. Um, I haven't thought about this, don't have a solution, but I'm happy to debate it. Uh, <laughs> but in actually in English, I think it's actually even easier than to put like he slash she, you know, just use there. And so far, uh, no client complained, no one ever complained. So, you know, I think uh, anyways, you, like pe people don't mind so much as they think they do. Uh, and the last point, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about this, like to emphasize that the words that you choose really matter. Because I've worked in AI, um, I know this. So AI using language corpora has been now shown to reproduce human biases, which is really interesting because a lot of people like <laughs> say like, oh, AI is bad, like AI is doing bad things, but it's like, but you teach the AI <laughs> how to do these things. Like AI is not bad or good, like, uh, like essentially, like it's just reproducing patterns. So there was this really interesting case of Amazon uh, basically developing, they wanted to automate their recruitment process. So just sorting out the CVs basically uh, for the interviews. And so they crafted this AI that could do that for me. <laughs> and it went super wrong because basically the AI started discriminating against women. <laughs> Because obviously the history, you know, of Amazon had been to hire primarily males, you know, male people. So it learned from that that it was preferable, you know, like to like have the CVs of male candidates put forward. And it started eliminating every uh, CV that contained the word women. So for example, so in the gender view, some people put the, their gender in the, you know, in the CV. I don't think it, it's a common practice, but it's maybe maybe still there if your your surname is like ambiguous or something and um, or like if you went to a, a women's college or whatever like it would automatically go like bye <laughs> so it was like so people yeah that that's really backfired <laughs> that was really really bad um, I've linked so this is one of the link uh, about that I've linked also a study actually proving that, that the semantics you use in the language corpora that you feed to your AI that can have a serious impact on how your AI learns. So we can't say, like, no one can say, I'm not, I'm not biased, you know, like, I'm not, no, like, the, the bias doesn't exist, like, blah, blah, blah. No, we are. I mean, AI is literally reproducing, like, all of this. So, um, yeah. And also, oh, yeah, I wanted to link that to the fact that we're also moving to documentation, like automated documentation with a, with chatbots or, you know, like that can craft uh, automated answers to what people ask them. 
So I think it will be very important in the future to carefully choose like the the word that you're that you're choosing in your documentation, and so that you really include include everyone basically. And yeah, I just put this picture because I thought it was nice. Uh, <laughs> this is actually so. This is a picture I took in Sacramento. That's my food. Over there. <laughs> Um, and that says, so the quote says, I don't think you can really see it that well. Words do not have natural meanings. Language is a social enterprise. So we're all responsible for using the right words and making people feel included. I feel this is really a, like an important responsibility that is taken way too lightly by way too many people. Um, yeah, so you guys. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah. And now I'm going to switch. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about design as well, because actually the people who have been the most vocal about like designing things inclusively are UI UX designers so far. Like, I haven't heard anyone, uh, anyone else like in the industry really pushing for a user inclusive documentation. And basically, uh, whoops. Yeah. So I started with my last word point. Oh no. Um, I'll start from there. <laughs> so one of the, the piece of advice I have is also to steal from your, your UI UX colleagues and to include uh, like inclusive visuals in your docs. And I have, so I want to open this link because it's a really quick manual. It's from UXLens. I'm going to close that. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. So they did this little guide about designing inclusive visuals, images, icons, color. And these are all things that we are using in our documentation as well. Like, I don't know, uh, if you're doing a tutorial, uh, you might use visuals like to represent your users. Or if you're doing a video, you know, like, I don't know, like with graphics or whatever like you want you can there's like a ton of things that you can use that are inclusive they give like really good advice like at how to get better photos and graphics um and how to personify your design yeah this is my favorite it's personify your design with a mascot uh i was talking about it with you i think because you're also using uh a koala right <laughs> yeah uh, so Maxim is a UI UX designer, <laughs> and he, <laughs> yeah, so he uses animals, and I think that's awesome, and we should use more animals, because they're totally neutral, like they don't, I mean, it, they're just animals, right? Anybody can, like, identify to whatever they're doing, they're just cute, <laughs> they're cute, and they don't, they're just animals, so, yeah. I don't know. This is this is one of my favorite. I haven't done it yet in my documentation, but I really wanna. I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, yeah, use diverse colors in illustrations. That's one of the good things that Slack, for example, did. Like they added so many like skin tones uh, for every reaction you can have, like going like you know like this or yeah like this. You can you have like a palette. You know, of colors that you can use to represent yourself. So I think it's, I think we should do it more as well. Like if you're representing, if you choose to represent users with like a real people or like with not like nothing gender neutral, like then maybe try to put a bit of color here and there, you know, like to just have a bit more diversity in your documentation. Um, well, this, that's one thing that I learned from Slack. And then you've got the, yeah, the icons. It's, uh, it's so complicated to find like an icon that will represent your user in like the most neutral way, I guess. But at the same time, you still want it to look like a human. <laughs> so it's a bit difficult. But in my, have you seen like in the presentation, the first slide, like with user, not the user? as I think they were pretty okay, but the, yeah, like I, w I was, wasn't myself too convinced, like, do, are people going to identify with that? 
So I don't know, but there's tons of stuff you can use now. Like I, fo I found that myself, uh, and yeah. Can I ask a thought here? Yeah. Do, do people find that your own gender bias determines what you think the genders might be? Yes, like, I am think. Am I might more likely to think that it, it's all men, apart from a couple that are kind of maybe a little. Whereas other people. Uh, think, you mean like yeah. in the text? Because uh, no, yeah, like the images, the images. Like, ah. yeah, I just wonder if your own. Bias makes you think what the ones that are supposed to be unbiased are. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, yeah. I'm not sure. That's a that's a good thought actually. Like, I don't know. That's interesting. Um, for me, it's like, of course, like I'm more likely to notice, you know, if there is no women represented, because I'm one. So then, if I see only men in the look, I'm like, it's but eh, like <laughs> you know, like it, it's weird. Um, so men maybe think another way, but it's not true because like I, I know, for example, I have a friend who is an architect and actually like he is the first one to notice when there is uh, pictures being taken in this company with no women in it. Like he's the first one to say like, hey, but why it's weird. Like we all look like a bunch of weird dudes. Like, you know, uh, what, why don't we have like any female colleague in the picture? Like we, it will look a bit more diverse and stuff. So, but women don't say anything. So. I don't know, like, depends, I think, on how people, uh, the level of education you have given yourself to that subject, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, plenty of icons uh, that you can... <laughs> what it says about photos, yeah, like, it's just to use your own. Uh, because they're more realistic, and that's true, you know, like, it's... Because, yeah, what we see in the media, and the, this, this is also why we need inclusive things, because what we have in the media is like not representative or not representative enough of what's going on in society. Um, I don't, I think it's going to take a while before, you know, like people catch up on this. Um, so if we can at least make uh, the user of a product, you know, like feel happy about themselves, like would be a good, good step forward. Um, so icons, except for that one, okay? Like we don't use that one. Um, better colors. Oh yeah, uh, color blindness, really important as well. Uh, this is actually actually so. When we were at this uh, conference in uh, in Poland, uh, like the SOAP conference, so I was really disappointed in the in the the presentation about how to use diversity as an asset in a team. That was, well, whatever. First of all, it was two white men who presented. So for me, it's like diversity. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I was, I mean, I'm sure they didn't mean anything bad with it. They just probably didn't think about it. But then again, like maybe you can educate yourself a little about that before you can talk about it. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, but I was really surprised by um, like a, a, a presentation I had no interest about that was about UX, UI. Um, that didn't contain the word diverse or inclusive or whatever, like in the title, I just went there because I don't know, I had nothing else to do. And um, this person who was presenting ended up talking about, yeah, like how to include your, like your users who cannot see colors, who cannot see, who do not have like any spatial <laughs> representation in mind, like, like <laughs> we were talking about like these IKEA manuals. You know, um, so they work great for a lot of people. They also don't work at all for people like me because I cannot, what I see in 2D, it, <laughs> it doesn't translate to like what I have in front of me. So I'm unable to relate one to the other. And I believe like there's like, really, like a, a lot of people who have that problem. Um, so you gotta be careful with the, design that you choose or maybe do multiple formats or I don't know, but like, it was really interesting to, to learn about this. So that's why I'm, I think I, I was mentioning that UI UX is like the most forward about that. Like they, they, they really think about that a lot and that the people that I hear, you know, talking about this, so that's why I'm stealing everything from them. Um, but yeah, so I just, yeah, wanted to show you quickly because it's a, like a, it's a nice article with, it's really nicely written, you know, good documentation. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways, I'll go back there. Um, yes. 
So I had started with the last bullet point, now I'm going up. Um, yeah. So in my search for inclusive ways of doing things, I was looking for inclusive design, inclusive documentation, blah, blah, blah. I, and I ended up finding that actually a lot of, like some, no, not a lot, some companies uh, have implemented an inclusive way of doing this from the beginning, including documentation. They have understood that users do not have the same learning, uh, learning abilities or learning patterns. Like we all learn things different ways. And <clears throat> for example, like Microsoft has put together a team of, uh, it's called the in inclusive, de inclusive design, Microsoft inclusive design team or something like that where they reflect on that and they build resources uh, for building products uh, for guidance. So basically, the, they're interested in finding what formats work for all of the users. So what it means is that you might have to either produce your documentation and make your documentation available on platforms that are more you know, like user friendly for your users, or maybe you might need to do like multiple yeah, multiple things like you might have like a manual, but also like tutor like video tutorials, uh, other things on top of that for different types of users because it's not like a one size one size fit, fits all. Like, uh, and I feel like we're kind of like res restricting ourselves to like we choose. Okay, this is our target group, so we're going to do documentation like this, but. I've also experienced that myself at, in my company, you know, like I, so I do something, I do the best I can. And then, so of course, very few people like to read documentation, so I don't blame them, but um, they give me useful feedback, you know, they're like, oh, but you know, like I, I learn better if I'm, if I'm watching a tutorial or if I'm seeing things that way or whatever. And I'm thinking of just like multi, instead of like a, just, I'm reusing basically my content, but put it in different formats for different types of users. I'm not sure, I haven't implemented that. I'm not sure what is, would the effort be or whatever, but I think it's an interesting idea and uh, maybe something you can, you can explore. Um, for example, yeah, like I just asked, so maybe you guys will do it, <laughs> like, to switch from diagramming to modeling uh, the software a software architecture because some people can see very well in 2d but the you know like it's nice also that you have a 3d representation that you can play with uh, so we'll see if that works <laughs> but uh, yeah but I'm not uh, again like in my company I cannot do everything on my own so I have first to work with developers see how they they're receptive to it and if I can just push that on them and uh, yeah so yeah, so I link basically I just linked for you the the Microsoft guide because they they explain things like in a super like easy way and I don't know you can download it like it's all like open open resources so it's nice to learn also like what big companies have to have to teach us um, and yeah 